Good evening. How is everybody doing out there <clears throat> in the internet land? This is your host, Doc, on this beautiful Friday, March 22nd, 2024, here with Strange Days Live. Hope you guys are doing well. <clears throat> I've been doing well. Uh, transmitting live from California. It's hot today. I was, maybe my room is just hot, but I always complain that it's hot. Uh, feels like 80 or something, but I don't know. Anyways, how are you guys been doing? The group keep growing. The group keep referring to our Strange Days Live um, <clears throat> Facebook group that I'm really glad it's been growing. And we got some possible interviews for next week. There's a gentleman that I'm very curious to interview and we've been kind of sharing uh, some messages back and forth. He's a very uh, interesting life story. His name is Paul Dale Roberts. We might be interviewing him next week sometime. I probably Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, former military intelligence officer. <clears throat> and uh, he has some stories on how MI investigated UFOs when he was with them in Korea. So that would be awesome to have him. He uh, wanted to come earlier, but uh, I think it's uh, it's better if we kind of prep him up a little bit so we can get more listeners and hopefully some people that would like to uh, post questions for somebody from the military background. I know I would. Um, let me just check, make sure that everything is cooking. Okay, so we're going live where we're supposed to go live. Okay, good. So welcome, everybody that's here tonight, spending their Friday night with me at 9. Like I said, 8 o'clock hour has been being taken by the Spanish version <clears throat> of this show. And um, 9 o'clock hour belongs to my OG crowd, which are you guys. Uh, again, very... Um, one second here, let me just fix. Very grateful that the show's been growing and uh, been getting a lot of new listeners enjoying the main channel, which is always really cool to see because that means your work is paying off. And, um, you know, we have some, I have some cool things planned out, um, you know, interviews and I don't know, just a lot of cool things, I guess, right? <laughs> um, our, our, as you guys know, I am. We do have uh, a live capabilities, and I just kind of bought the software that makes it really easy for you guys to call in. There's the the area code that you guys are gonna call if you're from within the U.S. You just call the nine five one triple eight zero three one three, or if you want to join via WhatsApp, you guys can do that as well. But I think you know for the U.S. listeners, I think the nine five one area code is probably the easiest way to get in touch with them. Hey, William79, how are you? Good to have you on the show again. This is the gentleman with the nice Stratocaster guitar. Um, welcome for everybody else that's joining in the show. Thank you for spending your Friday nights with me. I really uh, appreciate it. <clears throat> kind of flying blind today in regards to, um, you know, in, in regards to, I don't really have any topics, but I always sort of like to, sometimes engage in the news if there's something going on in the news that interests me. You know, I did a, a show last week in regards to Princess Kate, how she had been, uh, the, had she had been sort of in a state of uh, disappearance. And unfortunately it was released today that she's suffering from, uh, from cancer. So we pray for her for a speedy recovery. We don't know what type of cancer she has, but I pray that, Everything goes well with her. I know that for the last, um, I would say since, you know, the last, probably, yeah, about two two months, going into three months, she had been kind of MIA from the, from the public. And, um, you know, there was a lot of speculation there that something was going on, uh, just a lot of conspiracy theories. And then it turns out that uh, I believe today she... Um, she came out and announced that she's battling some sort of uh, of cancer. So it's very unfortunate that uh, that that's that was the reason why she was sort of unseen, if you will. But yeah, that's pretty sad. I hope that she does well. 
um, yeah, other than that, I just, um, other than that, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been nice. I've been, uh, kind of, you know, going a hundred percent here, a hundred miles an hour handling and juggling work and trying to do the two podcasts. So I'm getting a little bit tired, but Hey man, you got to do your thing, right? You got to hustle. Um, you guys have any? If you guys have any any stories for me, if you guys are too, if you're shy and you don't want to call, why don't you guys just go ahead and post them in the comment section, and then I can uh, we can discuss them or you can can email them. That would be a cool. Yeah, but that's probably gonna take too long for you guys to be writing. Um, but yeah, you can always email it. I'll put a link on the show towards the end, and uh, we can um, we can discuss them. Let's see. <clears throat> There's a, I'm going to just kind of read a few stories. Just to kind of like, there's have you guys ever heard of the Enfield monster? This occurred in 1973 in Illinois, you know, all the, that middle part of the U S you know, Ohio, Illinois, they have some like really, really weird, uh, really weird things going on, man. What's going on up in that area. So the Enfield monster uh, is basically refers to a report of identified creatures around the area of Enfield, Illinois, and the in the good U.S. of A. <clears throat> now Enfield lies, if you guys picture the the state of Illinois, um, it lies sort of in the the southeast portion of it, very small area. Um, and these uh, the first sightings of a monster were reported in April of '73. These reports were actually covered by the media at the time, so they made an impact. But some people actually have, have been suggesting uh, that it could have been uh, either a uh, escaped uh, kangaroo from a local local zoo or maybe a wild ape. Um, it's been used as a case study for a paper on social contagion. You guys know what social contagion is? Well, this is basically a behavior uh, or a set of emotions or a condition that uh, spreads around sort of like a virus, if you will, uh, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's nothing tangible. It's basically uh, it's like a collective behavior that kind of like a social, like, like a viral video, if you will, but within, uh, within society, right. It's, um, you know, for example, like an unplanned spread of ideas through a population, that would be sort of like a social contagion. Um, so it's very, very, uh, it's sort of like, yeah, like a something viral, like a viral video. So um, in, like I said, the Enfield monster case was actually used in a paper um, to support this uh, th theory of social contagion in 79. Most of the, well, the sociologists that were cited uh, gave this episode as a as a, an example of a collective behavior where a group or a crowd can be affected by the spread of group emotions, such as panic, hysterias, collective visions, and extreme instances of suggestibility. If you remember a few weeks ago, we read a case about the toxic lady of Riverside. Do you remember that? Um, this is about a lady who was undergoing, uh, she had extreme advanced cancer and, uh, not to deviate too much, but she had an extreme advanced form of ovarian, um, I believe it was ovarian or it was, uh, I think it was ovarian cancer. It was very advanced. She was only in her forties and her pain had been, or cervical cancer, one of those two pain had been so horrendous that she resorted to using some medications, that were um, brought from uh, Mexico. And so what happened was these medications, along with the fact that she had undergone chemotherapy, they actually, uh, they they have a, there's a conversion that goes on, you know, all the chemicals, when you expose chemicals to different chemicals, you can have a, a chemical reactions, if you will. So the chemicals that she was using topically uh, reacted with the chemo and they just created a, a mess, if you will. So lo and behold, uh, this lady was brought into an emergency department in Riverside, California, and then there was uh, a mass, uh, a group emotion, if you will, collective uh, behavior, which most of the nurses started fainting, uh, doctors started fainting, people starting, you know, just um, 
mass hysteria, if you will. <clears throat> so if you want to revise that, it, it's one of my older videos, if you want to go ahead and, and read that up. It's about the toxic lady of Riverside. But anyways, getting back to the Enfield monster uh, story. So basically, um, at about 10 p.m. on the night of April 25th of 1973, Mr. Henry McDaniel heard a scratching sound at his front door. Uh, he looked out and, you know, he didn't, he saw something that he thought might have been a bear, right? He took his gun and his flashlight and he actually headed outside into strong winds at the time. And between two rose bushes, he was able to kind of make out a creature of me. It was un unidentifiable to him. But uh, he later said that what, what took note is that it had three legs on it very short body and two little short arms and two pink eyes as big as flashlights. It stood about four and a half feet tall and it was grayish in color. He also added that it was um, almost like a human body. So something very, very strange, you know, three legs, short body, short arms, uh, like a little human body. So basically McDaniels, instead of uh, identifying this further, man, he just fired four shots at the creature. And actually one of the shots hit it and um, it caused him to hiss, you know, much like a kind of like a wildcat, sort of like a cat hiss before it fled towards a nearby uh, railway embar embarkment that was approximately uh, about 50 feet away. But he, he, this particular creature was able to cover those 50 feet, according to Mr. McDaniels, in about three jumps, okay? So Mr. McDaniels obviously called the local authorities who actually discovered footprints in the soft earth uh, near his home which McDaniels described that they had some kind of like dog-like shape to them and where, where he had, the, they had, there were six toe pads, the, the toe imprints on the ground. The police actually considered McDaniels to be a rational and a sober mind at the time. Okay, so he hadn't been pounding on uh, any uh, past on that particular uh, night. Um, so in his reporting of the incident and in letter press interviews, McDaniels said that uh, if they don't find it, they will find more than one. And it won't be from that pla from this planet, I can tell you that. So he was pretty convinced that he was seeing some kind of weird entity. Uh, other investigators resorted to nearby residents, and they told that uh, the George uh, Greg Garrett, I'm sorry, which was a 10 year old neighbor of Mr. McDaniel's, claimed to have had an encounter with this particular creature about a half an hour before McDaniel's did. And he had a little boy said that uh, the creature had stepped on his feet tearing his tennis shoes to shreds. The boy later told uh, the Western Illinois University Research that his report was a hoax to teach Mr. M and have fun with an out-of-town newsman. Yeah, I was going to say, I was kind of skeptical. I mean, if anything has the possibility to tear your feet, man, to tear your shoes, I'm sure your feet would, uh, your socks would not be very protective of your toes. Uh Two weeks later, then this is in May 6, McDaniel sexually called radio station WWKI, claiming to have seen the creature again at 3 a.m. that morning. So came back for more fun. It was um, negotiating um, the trestle on the railroad tracks near his home, and McDaniel said that I saw something moving out of the railroad tracks, and there it stood. He said, I didn't shoot at it or anything. <laughs> It started on down the railroad tracks, and it wasn't in a big hurry or anything. A search party included uh, WWKI's news director, Rick Rainbow, which explored the area later that day and reported observing an ape-like creature standing in an abandoned building near the McDaniels house. Uh, they claimed to have made a recording of the creature's cries and fired a shot at it before it fled. Man, don't mess with people from this town. I'm telling you, you're going to get gonna get shot these people just kind of start shooting like anything cryptozoologist lauren coleman investigated the case and the sound recording two days later after a day after mcdaniels was interviewed in their local radio the local press reported that the police were called to investigate reports of gunfire and arrested five young men from out of town who had come to enfield in order to photograph the creature carrying shotguns and rifles for quote-unquote protection the man having claimed that they have sighted the creature, uh, the White County Sheriff dismissed the report of this monster hunting expedition as an exaggeration, saying that the men were just out drinking, <laughs> drinking and raising hell. <laughs> Mentioning the monster only briefly during the questioning, the men were charged with hunting violations. That's some fun stuff, man. That can't go wrong. This is the 70s, early 70s. Boys were out drinking and raising hell. <clears throat> Good time as any. 
drink some brews, get, go on a cruise, get yourself a shotgun and just shoot at anything that kind of walks funny. Hate to be a cat in that part of town, tell you that much. So that is uh, the story of the Enfield monster, the hissing three-legged animal that was shot by one Mr. Henry McDaniel back in the 70s. My gosh. Um, yeah, I haven't uh, I hadn't heard that before myself. That was a fun story. Let's see here. Now we're going to talk about, uh, now I can use the, uh, the, the S word. Uh, you know, it's, it's take somebody taking their own S. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I call it deletion. So somebody, when they delete themselves from the world. So they, this is called the deletion hotel. Take take the D and, you know, change it for with, the, with the word with the S. So in Colombia, there's a hotel called Hotel del Salto. Uh, and has more stories as one of the most haunted places on earth more than it does actual tenants. So it, it was turned into a museum, actually. The hotel was designed by a designated architect back in 1923, and it overlooks uh, beautiful falls that uh, are, are in the area of Colombia. And these views were said to be so spectacular and kept, uh, so guests, unfortunately, kept getting a little too close to the falls, um, translated to the Hotel of the Leap. Oh, wow, okay, I see, I see what they did there. Hotel del Salto, it means the Hotel of the Leap. So the Hotel del Salto is full of stories of people leaping to their deletions. According to local legend, the indigenous Muisca tribe escaped from Spanish colonizing by leaping off the cliffs some centuries before. So is it a question of time repeating itself or the fact that uh, they didn't take uh, enough precautions at this hotel in Colombia that people were getting too close and falling over the railing? <clears throat> Uh, either way, it's not a very pleasant trip. Goodness gracious. When you think of haunted dolls, it's likely like the creepy old Victorian-looking porcelain kind that springs to mind. What kind of kind of dolls? I mean, to me, when, for some, now I just associate creepy dolls with like the Raggedy Ann, you know, like that, uh, the Raggedy Ann doll that's um, that's said to be uh, haunted. I forgot the name of the family that I was at museum. Annabelle, right? But also I think about uh, like the Chucky, you would think about the Chucky doll, even though that's obviously fake. But uh, the porcelain ones are kind of weird. There's a video that I saw on YouTube uh, about a couple who are exchanging stories or being interviewed more, more than that, being interviewed about something that's going on. And they have a porcelain doll sitting on a on one of these uh, rocking chairs. And all of a sudden, like the, the interview goes quiet and the, the little doll Start and the chair starts rocking when only the little doll is like sitting there and people start freaking out. See that video is kind of kind of weird. But anyways, none of which you probably have laying around. I mean, a lot of people don't collect dolls anymore. But still, uh, don't get too comfortable around any kid's toys too soon. Says the story. Uh, a Disney Frozen Elsa doll was gifted for Christmas 2013 in the Houston area. Made air, uh, made a lot of her, uh, headlines this year because they said that this Elsa doll had actually become haunted. The doll recited phrases from the movie Frozen and sang sang the, the popular song Let It Go when a button on its necklace was pressed. For two years it did that in English. Uh, Mrs. Emily Madonia, who was the mother of the recipient of the doll. But in 2015, says Mrs. Madonia, that it started doing alternating between Spanish and English. Uh, there wasn't a button to change these. It was just random. Okay, the family has owned the doll for more than six years and never changed its batteries. The mom also says that the doll would uh, randomly begin to speak and sing even when the switch is turned off. The family decided to throw the creepy doll out in December of 2019. Weeks later, they found it inside a bench in their living room. The kids insisted that they did not put it there and believe them because they wouldn't have dung up the garbage outside, said the mom. Two. KPRC2 News in Houston. At that point, Elsa ceased to sing the English rendition of Let It Go altogether, speaking only in Spanish when pressed. The family then double bagged the bizarre doll and placed it at the bottom of the garbage, which was then taken out on garbage day. They went on a trip shortly after, but when they returned, Elsa had to come back and was waiting in the backyard of their home. This time, the family <laughs> mailed Elsa to a friend a family friend in Minnesota who taped the haunted doll to the front bumper of his truck. It doesn't seem to have made its way back to Houston yet, as per Mrs. Madonia, latest February Post update on a creepy doll. Wow. 
I mean, yeah. There's a lot of uh, a lot of things to be discussed, if you will, discuss there. First of all, I mean, uh, it could be, it could be. Just, I'm just saying that the the doll, uh, you know, they could be like pre-programmed with two languages, right? They could be. Pro, I mean, uh, uh, or they can become programmed with an English and Spanish, something short-circuited. And uh, the doll started speaking Spanish. I mean, but uh, the the weird thing about this is the fact that it kept uh, that it keeps reappearing. That's a mysterious thing. All right, um, I'm just kind of checking something out. Sorry, guys, don't mind don't mind me. I'm just trying to. I'm supposed to be the show. Supposed to be streaming on. My Facebook group, but for some reason it's not. Anyway, no, I just put it live so a lot of people can kind of tune in that way. Okay, cool. Let me just see if it's working. Sorry, guys, it's technology sometimes. Okay, whatever. Uh, let's see. So that was the horror story about the Elsa doll, the whacked out Elsa doll. And. Now, this is about an exorcism that apparently went wrong. In August of 2016 in North London, a 26-year-old Kennedy Ive began acting very strange and aggressive following a pain in his throat. He reportedly bit his father, threatened to cut off his own um, male uh, appendage, and complained of a python or a snake inside him before his family were able to restrain him to his bed with cable ties and excessive force. Family then set about attempting to quote unquote cure Kennedy through restraints and prayer over the next three days. The court was told, okay, so something else, something bad happened here if there was a court involved. His brother and Colin told the police, uh, it's clear that things, uh, the things was in him. Uh, what we believe was a demon because it was not natural and it was clearly trying to delete him, he said. We had to restrain him from himself. It was clear that if we did not restrain him, he could have tried to harm people in our family. Uh, Kennedy uh, had been bound to his bed for three days without medical attention when his brother called emergency service explaining that Kennedy was complaining of dehydration. He appeared to have developed breathing issues as well and was pronounced deceased at 10, 15, 10, 17 a.m. While police were at the house, Colin, allegedly carry out an attempt at resurrection by a chanting and praying for his brother. All seven of Kennedy's family members were accused of manslaughter, false imprisonment and causing or allowing the death of a vulnerable adult. Post-mortem examination revealed over 60 wounds, including a possible bite on Mr. Kennedy's body and his father, Kenneth, along with four of his brothers, sustained injuries as well. Kenneth, told jurors he ordered his son to take shifts and use overwhelming force, but denies that an association with the cult, occult, or secret society played any parts in the passing of Kennedy. After a fourth-day jury deliberation, all seven family members were cleared of charges on March 14, 2019. Goodness, poor guy. I was listening to one of the old Art Bell shows when they, when they had Father Malachi Martin, and uh, he was speaking about that he had uh, contacted or somehow uh, brought in um, a psychiatrist to maybe follow him and uh, be able to attend on some of the exorcist uh, exorcisms that he was able to provide. And he said that the, the doctor, psychiatrist, after becoming involved with the practice of exorcism, uh, quit psychiatry altogether. I guess he was led to believe that uh, possessions had to do a lot more with, uh, I mean, some of these illnesses had to a lot to, uh, had a spiritual component more, more than a, a psychiatric component, if you will. Now, I think that's, I mean, that's uh, not the right way to approach things. There certainly are psychiatric issues. You can't just kind of, you know, att attest everything to just, you uh, you know, possession, but uh, yeah, that kind of made an impact when I read about that. I thought it was uh, 
that it was it was heavy, you know, as somebody with that, that kind of experience would just kind of all of a sudden quit his career and just be like, no, I think I'm going to stick to this better. Yeah, very strange, huh? But I feel awful for this Kennedy fellow. That um, poor guy, man. But he had to undergo all the suffering in order for, uh, you know, for his folks. Uh, I mean, this is a weird thing that their folks were found not, not culpable somehow. So I mean, there's 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 more to the story, uh, obviously, that uh, that we're led to believe if if that's what happened. I mean, to find all all family members not culpable, obviously, there's stuff that's not being fully discussed. Anyways, let's see here. Florida devil worshiping. Friends noticed that Danielle Harkin, a 35-year-old school teacher near St. Petersburg, Florida, Florida, started acting strangely in June of 2012, uh, developing a, an interest in demonic rituals. Soon after, she was arrested for abuse. I'm not going to mention that word. <laughs> yeah, for uh, doing bad things. And uh, Daniel Harkins told... Uh, people that they needed to rid their body of demons as the group gathered before dusk Saturday around a small fire near the St. Petersburg Pier. Yeah, I'm going to skip this story because I know I'm going to get in trouble reading it. And I, I've, I've read it before because I remember it. Let's see here. So go on to this. Story. Have you guys heard of, uh, have you guys watched the, the Netflix special on the Cecil Hotel? This is the passing away of Elisa Lamb. This takes place here in California, Los Angeles. I've passed by the hotel a bunch of times, actually. Never been tempted to go in, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I passed by the hotel. Um, Elisa Lamb was last seen on January thirty first, twenty thirteen, in the lobby of the Cecil Hotel in downtown LA. She was actually vacationing through the West Coast documented their trip uh, that she was going under uh, in her blog and checking it in with their parents every day. On January 31st, uh, for some uh, reason, those calls stopped and my Mrs. Lamb had completely vanished. Uh, soon, uh, the police were involved and her parents arrived, I believe she was from uh, Canada, to help with the search. They had uh, nothing. It's what the, the, the LAPD said. There was no leads, anything at all. LAPD released uh, an elevator surveillance footage of Mrs. Lamb before her disappearance, actually, and the footage shows Mrs. Lamb behaving very strangely in the elevator. She appeared to be talking with invisible people, peering around the corner of the door, crouching in the corner and opening and closing the door. But what was exactly going on in this video raises more questions than answers. The theories obviously range from psychotic episode to possession to unknown assailants just out of the camera's view on the video, unfortunately. Around that time, hotel guests started reporting weird things happening within the, uh, ho uh, the Cecil Hotel water supply as well. I'll play the video. Give me a second here. For those that are, I'm going to play the video for you guys here. If you guys are watching live so we can partake, we're going to analyze. That's the words we need to use. Analyze the video. All right, so... So here's a video of Mrs. Elisa Lamb, and you can see her kind of entering the elevator. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's kind of squatting down. I don't think she's pressing any buttons, and all of a sudden she kind of hides in the corner there. <clears throat> the elevator's kind of slow, but she hasn't really pressed any buttons. And she's kind of slowly making her way out. It kind of peers through as if she's expecting to see somebody or maybe scare somebody. Yeah. Seems like she's waiting for somebody to come in, like according to her, I mean, the behavior, like she's hiding, like she wants to like spook somebody that's going to come in the elevator. Doesn't seem, to me, it doesn't seem like she's afraid. It seems like she's kind of waiting for somebody to walk in so she can spook them. She actually, she's stepping out the elevator, kind of looking down the hall, made a weird jump. And then she goes back in the elevator again. I mean, it is definitely strange behavior for sure. 
but nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. <clears throat> but she doesn't, the, to me, uh, it doesn't seem like she's being threatened or like she's being fearful. And obviously that elevator, that elevator is not being used very much because it's been kind of remaining stable for almost like a minute and a half. <clears throat> Could she have been under like the influence of alcohol? Now she seems like she's like pushing all the buttons on the elevator. I mean, she she acting a little bit like a drunk person would act, right? She's pressing the buttons, but she's also heading out of the elevator. It's kind of odd. Yeah, she's acting weird, like like if she was talking to somebody, but overdoing the gestures, you know? I'm going to forward it a little bit more. Then she kind of, the elevator closes, and then she's out of the picture. Then it opens, closes again, and then we lose sight. So, yeah, um, I've never seen that that long of a video, but it, that was interesting. Okay, so. So around the time the hotel guests uh, started reporting that weird things were happening with the whole, with the CISO hotel water supply, okay? So now we have a disappearance of a girl. She was acting a little bit strange, ghost missing. There's no lead at all, investigation lead by the police, just this kind of weird footage. One of the guests that was staying at the Cecil that day uh, said that the, the shower was awful, said Sabina Bond, who actually spent eight days there during the investigation. When you turn on the tap on, the water was coming back uh, black first for the for two seconds, and then it was going back to normal. So you would open up the tap, you'd get like this black fluid coming out. Uh, the tap water tasted horrible. Oh, goodness. Uh, the tap water tasted horrible, Bot said. It had a very funny, sweetie, disgusting taste. It was a very strange test, taste. She said, I can barely describe it. Oh, God, she had tasted the water, actually. But for a week, uh, they never complained, obviously. We never thought anything of it, she said, but we thought it was just the way that it was here. On the morning of February 19th, a hotel employee climbed to the roof and used the ladder to investigate uh, the hotel's water storage tanks since I guess they've been getting complaints about the quality of the water. And that's where authorities found the decomposing naked body of Mrs. Lamb, whose personal items were found nearby. After an autopsy, her death was labeled accidental. ABC LA report at a time about the strange circumstances and the hotel's past. So that's so weird, huh? How somebody could like... Just kind of climb onto like a water tower naked and I don't know, maybe go for a swim. Maybe she went for a swim. You know, maybe she was under the influence of something and she went swimming in a water tank. It's not impossible. And then the you know, these these doors of these water tanks are super, super heavy. Uh obviously when you're inside of a water tank and the door if the door closes on you. Uh, there's no way you can prop it open, especially a, a, a small, thin lady. Or maybe the door didn't close on her; just just couldn't get out. How you get out of a, you know, how to get out? How do you get out? Right? You can like hold on. Sometimes the water level is way below, so you can't really jump up and hold on to anything. Any, anyways, that would be super, super uh, weird way to go. So. Uh, that was on the on the nineteenth when they found her. So after autopsy, we talked about that they, her death was labeled accidental. The tank has a metal latch that can be opened, but authorities said access to the roof is secure with an alarm and a lock. Uh, the single room occupancy hotel had an unusual history prior to that. Actually, if you're familiar with the Night Stalker, Mr. Richard Ramirez, uh, he was actually found guilty of 14 slaying in the 1980s. Uh, he lived on the 14th floor of this hotel for several months in 1985. There was another uh, serial killer, Mr. Jack Untwerger, who was suspecting of uh, deleting three prostitutes during that time. He lived there in 1991, and he uh, deleted himself in jail in 1994. 1962, at the same hotel, a female occupant jumped out of one of the hotel's window, killing, uh, deleting herself, and also deleting a pedestrian whom she happened to land upon. 
in February 2021, a Netflix documentary called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel explored Elisa's tragic case and the history of the cursed Cecil Hotel. Yeah, that's uh, I've never seen it myself, but I might be inclined to watch it in the future. Looks looks interesting, looks promising. Uh, sorry, you guys. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this isn't that kind of wild? All these uh, weird things. You guys have any cool stories you want to share? Either you can put them in the comment section, or just we're gonna just call, right? Give me one second, guys. I gotta just one second. All right. I have to send a quick test text. Sorry. Um, last year, the Indianapolis Star published a lengthy report on a family terrorized by three children allegedly possessed by demons. The account of Latoya Emmons and her family tells disturbing stories of children climbing up the walls, getting thrown across rooms, and children threatening doctors in deep, unnatural voices. I've heard those voices. I'm a doctor. I attest to that. Um, it would seem like something straight out of a movie, a work of fantasy, except all of these accounts were more or less corroborated with nearly 800 pages of official records obtained by the Indianapolis Star and recounted in more than a dozen interviews with police, psychologists, family members, and a Catholic priest. So the more chilling sections of this report includes a segment about the possessed nine-year-old. According to Washington's original DCS report, an account corroborated by Walker, the nurse, Nine-year-old had a weird grin and walked backwards up a wall to the ceiling. He then flipped over Camel, landing on his feet, and he never let go of his grandmother's hand. Goodness. Another segment of the piece reads that the 12-year-old would later tell mental health professionals that she sometimes felt um, somebody was holding her uh, in uh, choking her so you couldn't she couldn't speak nor move she said that she heard uh voices uh, that she would never uh see her family again and that she wouldn't uh she wouldn't be having fun the utah uh well give me a second here sorry guys uh, it's one of those deals when i have to like send uh All right, let's talk about this little guy here. This little guy is known as the phone stalker. There was a bunch of phone stalker. Were you, you, you guys, some of you guys listening out that were probably little phone stalkers as well. I know I was a little phone stalker in the 80s. I used to, everybody I think had, uh, had somebody they called and they acted weird, right? I mean, we all did it. It was fun. It happened in the 80s, okay, like 40 years ago. So um, liability is probably way gone. Anyways, um, did you guys ever have? I remember there was there was weird numbers that usually that usually always used to get passed out. Um, my cousin had a number for this particular guy that we would call. Now we wouldn't stalk him or anything, obviously. I, I'm not gonna use the word stalk. I didn't do any stalking, okay. <clears throat> um, I didn't do any. I didn't do any stuff. What I did was uh, prank calling. That's what it was. Uh, I did. We did a prank calling. So, like I was telling you guys, my uh, my cousin had a number for some guy. I have no idea how the numbers got around. This was in the '80s, so who knows? But yeah, this guy would would always uh, we would call him occasionally, and he had. A, very distinct, uh, extravagant <laughs> personality, and he said some things that shouldn't be said out loud. But uh, yeah, it was one of those weird people that you would just kind of call, and then uh, you would kind of get the kick out of it. Who knows how? Who knows how that guy got famous? But I'm sure a lot of people call them. Anyways, getting back to the phone stalker case in 2007, ABC News documented a series of cell phone calls to families with terrifying specific deletion threats. Uh, the identify, unidentified caller knew exactly what families were doing and what they were wearing. That's pretty crazy. 
uh, but this is 2007. Uh, the family say the calls come in at all hours of the night, uh, threatening to delete people, pets, and even other families. Voicemails arrived playing recordings of private conversations the people were having, including one with a local police detective. Man, that's weird. The caller knows, the family said, what they were wearing and what they're doing. And after months of investigating, police seemed powerless, powerless to stop them. I would probably say the caller had some kind of camera installed in this property. That's possible that he had a camera installed in that way. He was able to, you know, he snaked the camera. This went on with the uh, Kinkanal family for months, who reported a caller with a scratchy voice threatening with the Firecrest Washington police try to find the culprit, the calls were traced back to Kinkendall's own phones. Oh, get out. Even when they were turned off. What the heck? That's pretty crazy. So the calls were coming from their own phones. They got worse. The Kinkendalls and two other uh, Firecrest families told ABC News that they believe the callers are using their cell phone to spy on them. They say that the hackers know their every move, where they are, and what they're doing, and what they're wearing. Ooh, the callers have recorded private conversation, the family and police said, including a meeting with the local detective. Yeah, that's pretty scary there. I mean, they could have tapped somehow to their cell phones, right? And then kind of revert the calls and make them seem like they're coming from the from the um, their own phones. I, I think that's what I think. Yeah, ugh. Now, the next story, I'm going to skip it for your own good. It's pretty nasty. But, yeah, uh, so here we are. Hope you guys are doing great. I'm going to go in here, go to the comment section. Uh, hey, William, thank you. appreciate it, man. Uh, there's also a lot of people listening. If you guys want to either call for a story, if you guys want to tell us a story, or if you want to just put your own story in the comment section, I would appreciate it. Goodness, yeah, that that's some weird stuff. Um, I mean, they get calls and you know to, to people to describe like down to like what you're wearing. I mean, the police are. I would imagine what what, what can the police do really? Uh, and the only plausible thing, I it's the fact that um, that somebody was tapping in their their cameras and their cell phones in 2007 um, was. Was that even possible cameras? I think the when did the iPhone come out? I think the iPhone came out uh, two thousand yeah two thousand seven okay so it came but maybe if it was and it doesn't mention the phone but in two thousand seven that's uh, so the iPhone came out. I mean you, you could I mean technically if you think about it it's a portable camera and microphone right the iPhone so back in its days of infancy I'm sure it was pretty easy to hack but the, you have to be pretty mean to carry out a an elaborate plan like this. <clears throat> to the point where, you know, you're having people call the cops. That's pretty, that's pretty, uh, pretty bad. I'll look for some other, I like to find like the weird, beaten off uh, stories that, you know, that are not like your typical thing. So things that haven't been discussed a lot because it, you know, it keeps it fresh, you know. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, excuse me. This is uh, Jeff, a resident of Dayton, Ohio. Here we go again, Ohio. Was driving with his three-year-old son, Miles, in the back seat. They passed by a cemetery. This is a true story. It was a modest cemetery with only flowers and small plaques. It basically looked like a giant garden, sort of like that, the new type of cemeteries. Jeff explains on Monsters Among Us. According to Jeff, as they drove by his toddler, who had been happily singing, abruptly stopped, pointed to the cemetery, and said, Look at all those people. Jeff turned to look, but didn't see a soul. Very confused, he asked Miles what he was talking about. Um, he said, All those people over there, his son replied. There sure are a lot of them, Grandma. They're, they're, sorry, there sure are a lot of grandmas, is what the little boy said. As Jeff tells it, chills ran down his spine as he asked his son what the people were doing. He said, they're all standing there looking down at the grass, Miles said. Completely unsettled by the conversation, Jeff sped up and drove home later the same day. He says his young son was watching TV when he turned to Jeff and said, you know, they weren't alive. 
Thinking Miles was referring to the cartoon, Jeff asked what he meant. The people we saw, they were all paused, his son replied. I don't know if my kid has a, some kind of sixth sense, Jeff says, or if it's just a wild imagination. Boy, that's, that could leave you frozen stiff, if your boy was to say. People were just frozen. The Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, has been around for more than 100 years and was built by a posh, uh, for a posh gateway for the wealthy, seeking solitude in the mountains of beautiful Colorado. As the years passed, however, the occupancy declined, and by the 70s, the Grand Hotel had fallen into disrepair. It was around this time that the famed author Stephen King spent the night there and was inspired to write a book. The name? The Shining. The book and blockbuster film helped return the Stanley to its former glory. Now, guests come in in droves to see the hotel that inspired one of the scariest horror movies of all times. Given its history, it should come as no surprise that many visitors report strange happenings. Aware of the ghostly rumors, Texas resident Henry Yaw booked a last-minute getaway in April of 2016 to, quote-unquote, check it out. After arriving, Mr. Yaw had dinner, then wandered around the Stanley to take photos. Stopping at the staircase, he waited for people to clear the area, then took a picture, thinking nothing of it. Later that night, however, Mr. Yaw fell seriously ill. I felt really sick. I had the shivers, and I was like, something's really wrong, he tells Today.com. His companion suggested he go to the emergency room, but Mr. Yaw refused. On the trip home, Mr. Yaw began swiping through the phone, the pho his phone and the photos he had taken. When he discovered what he said was a really, really, really strange image of somebody standing on the stairs, except at the time of the photograph, nobody was there. The next day, he posted the photo on Instagram, half-joking that he'd capture a ghost, and the world took notice. Almost overnight, Yao found himself in the limelight, with his ghost picture warranting attention from global media outlets and paranormal experts who wanted to, quote-unquote, examine the photograph. Some experts say that there are two ghosts, and other people said the reason I got sick was because the ghost was trying to materialize, taking the energy out of me, he said. There are so many theories about this. And what does Mr. Yao think? I have no idea, he said, as he laughed. I'm going to show you this picture because you guys deserve it. Let's see. Uh, for all of you guys are watching on. <clears throat> Let me see if you guys can. Uh, here we go. Let me take off this little banner here. So there's a well, bad quality. Here we go. I don't know if you guys can probably get closer to your phone, but yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> yeah. There's definitely um, there's definitely somebody there or something there. Uh, you can see the outstretch. You can see uh, probably somebody, a woman, maybe wearing a nightgown with a with an outstretched tan, wearing a black dress. Yeah, pretty odd. So that's one of the photographs taken by Mr. Yao. And that's at the Stanley Hotel in Estee Parks, Colorado. The <clears throat> what was the inspiration for the movie The Shining? Let's see here. What else? Uh, through Salem, Massachusetts is actually better known for its infamous witch trials. There have been plenty of other chilling stories throughout its 400-year history. One of them is the tale of Captain Joseph White, a wealthy merchant who was found bludgeoned in his bed. It was a crime motivated by money, according to Giovanni Alaviso, owner and tour guide at the Salem Historical Tour, who says the 82-year-old merchant was allegedly targeted by greedy brothers brothers hoping to get their hands on his will. Brothers Joseph and Francis Knapp enlisted the help of Richard Crown to get uh, the job done. Later in the evening with Captain White was asleep, Mr. Crownchild came in. He goes upstairs to the second floor and takes a club and deletes the captain. The deletion resulted in a scandalous trial and is said to be the inspiration for Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, as well as the game Clue. Wow. 
Whether it's the brutal nature of the crime or revenge for the attempt to steal his money, the spirit of Captain Joseph White is said to still wander the halls of his former home. People believe Captain White is roaming around that house, protecting whatever treasure he reportedly has, Mr. Alabiso said. Tourists take photos of the house, and despite being empty, many pictures reveal shadowy figures, both male and females, in the windows and on the landing of the Gardner Pinkrest house. Who are they? No one knows. It's definitely absolutely active, Mr. Alabiso said. Okay, I think we're getting ready for maybe one more. One more, one more. In 1990, Julie, a resident of Portland, Oregon, was driving out the city to meet with friends when she found herself in traffic. The 18-year-old soon discovered that the cause of the slowdown was due to a dreadful car crash. And to her horror, uh, she passed the scene. She realized that somebody had passed. A moment later, there was a woman sitting in my passenger seat, Julie says, on Monster Among Us. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that? Though she admits it sounds crazy. Yeah, don't you think? Julie reports seeing a woman dressed in work clothes seated next to her. And despite being in a complete shock, the woman in the passenger seat was even more freaked out. She looked like somebody who just suddenly ended up in somebody else's car. Wow, what a story. Julie says of the incident, panicked, the woman demanded to know how she got in there and who Julie was. It was then that Julie noticed the woman had an unearthly quality about her and realized that whoever she passed on the side of the road was somehow in the car with her. Ma'am, you need to calm down. My name is Julie, and I'm here to help you. She says she told the stranger. Julie later went on to explain to the woman that she'd been in a car accident and somehow ended up in her passenger seat. The woman was stricken. At that exact minute, they passed a clearing in the trees. With some encouragement from Julie, the woman peacefully walked towards the sun, then disappeared. In complete disbelief, Julie pulled over and convinced herself she imagined the whole thing. Several days later, however, a story came in the news about a truck a trucker injured in a car accident. Before they finished, they threw a picture up of the woman that was in, the, in my car and explained that she had passed away in the accident. Julie said during the podcast, it was unbelievable. It was too much. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty scary. How sad. They, they, they've, as I told you guys before in previous shows, that there's uh, history stories of a lot of people that have uh, worked in the health field and um, have experienced uh, seeing, uh, you know, ghost, quote unquote, when somebody has passed. I just retold the story a few days ago about that uh, fireman who uh, came upon a, a, an accident, took uh, the victim to the hospital, and uh, as they were working on one of the trauma rooms on the victim, the victim actually made an appearance the corner of the room and told him and the doctor to please stop working on him and uh, verifiable story that's one i heard on art bell so sometimes people kind of tend to linger and the you know before they kind of make their final travels they kind of linger sort of a, a, as a shock of where they are they're at um there's been other stories about paramedics also encountering car accident victims in which it kind of pop up, but they can kind of feel the presence of somebody else being near them when the, when there's a fresh passing, you know? Yeah, must be tough. Let's see here. All right, I think we're going to do last one. Sarah from Lancaster, Ohio, tells uh, the story of his ch her childhood dog named Cricket, who, according to Sarah, was a pretty unhappy dog. She uh, was a cranky. She only liked my grandma, Sarah says, and she didn't seem like she felt well. Still, the family loved their dog and was devastated when the pup ran right into, right into the road and was struck by a passing car. And they were preparing to leave, as they were preparing to leave on a family vacation. What a way to start, huh? It was very sad, very upsetting, especially with me being a child. My grandma was there. She loved cricket. I loved her. They had this very special relationship that none of us had. Uh, despite the loss, the family had 
prepaid for their vacation and not having a lot of money, they decided to go, leaving Cricket with an aunt who offered to take this, uh, you know, take care of the necessary details, if you will. Upon arriving at the hotel where they were staying, Sarah says the family was melancholic and sad over the tragedy that just occurred. When we got to the bed in the middle of the night, I'm not sure why I woke up, but I startled, but I was startled. Woke up, sat on my bed and looked down, and on the floor of the hotel was Cricket, a full body apparition of her, says Sarah. She looked so happy. She looks different dog. She was jumping around. All the crankiness and all the unhappiness she had was now gone. It was like she was coming to tell me that everything was okay. It was the clearest apparition. I've never seen an apparition again. And it was the first and only time. Sarah says she told her mom in the morning that what she seen and her mom dismissed it as middle school brain just trying to make sense of the loss. I guess that's possible, says Sarah, but to this day I can still envision cricket in that moment. I've never forgotten that image and it helped me feel better about what happened because she seemed so happy and I do think that she visited me that night. All right, folks, with that being said, I thank each and every one of you guys for listening to the show. May God bless you. Have a great weekend. I shall see you, God be willing, on Monday for uh, other stories. Hey, Joe, good to see you, my friend. Joe Breezy is here. Um, it's good to see you guys, talk to you guys, and relate these strange stories. Uh, God bless you. Have a great weekend once again. I shall be back on Monday, and we have some good interviews lined up for next week. Okay? Take care, guys. Doc signing out.